So the next screen I'm going to share with you guys, um, we're going to talk about how we go about doing this accommodation modification thing and how we think about it. So it all starts with planning. We have to plan. I know sometimes we just need those days where we wing it or you plan and it just doesn't go well. So then you have to wing it. But when you're thinking about the students in your class um, and not just that one special student, but all of the students and their learning needs, Planning is an absolute must. You have to be able to plan. Um, one of the things that we tend to do is we go, okay, I've been doing, especially for teachers that have been doing this for a while. They go, I've been doing this. I know this activity. And then you go, oh, but I have jo little Johnny in my class. I need to, I need to basically remove stuff. And so we, we make the mistake of going from the top and working downward to get their their standard or their instruction. But that's actually quite flip than what we should be doing. We should always start from the bottom and work up. And what I mean by that is you think, what's the most basic foundational element or standard that I want these students to get? Then you can start to add content, add dynamic, add activities, add books, articles, um, videos, whatnot. And so you've already got your, your, your basic um, foundation of what you want for the students that have maybe have modifications. You've already done it. Now for all the rest of your class, you can start adding stuff in. Um, so try not to use the we're going to dumb it down technique or start to remove material to make it uh, more doable for the student. Um, because ultimately, if you are asking yourself when you're thinking about any kind of standard or lesson, what is what is it? What's the driving goal? What's the objective? That should be um, key in your planning for all of your students. But you've, like I said, you've already got it for the students that have um, a 504 and IEP. By the way, does it help to have? you know, kind of the backwards design mindset where you have the summative in mind, the final su summative that you're really wanting them to reach. And, and then uh, look, what you just described is essentially scaffolding, right? Mm -hmm. right? So have that, that final summative assessment in mind, and then you're building from the foundation up to that, to that final ah, that you want them to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. As long as that summative is, is a good one, <laughs> right? right? If we're not just good, because then I think people, uh, what I don't want people to hear is, oh, we're teaching to a test. Mm. Oh, no. Right? We don't want to teach to a test, but if it's a good summative that actually does um, reflect well the overall standards of your course, then absolutely we should try to hit that because we want to be able to test them on what we've given them, um, which is the next thing too, is that once you have those key pieces, you need to actually then create your modified material and your study guide and your, your test. Um, this is probably one of the things that teachers kind of forget to do often is they'll say, oh, I know I've got that modified student, but then they'll forget to create their own assignments. So if we're using Google Classroom, which we are a lot right now, they'll just put an assignment in there and they'll forget to deselect those students. Um, which we'll get more into in the next episode, but those mm -hmm. students should have specific study guides for just the material that you have taught them that you want them to know. Um, don't give them the whole packet and then say, well, just do a couple of these things because that's overwhelming to them. Kind of like Cassie's book, the Uncle Tom's Cabin book. You're going to shut them down if you give them too much material. Mm -hmm. Okay, standards-based learning makes all of this so much easier. If you know what you're going for, and you know, I mean, how how easy is it to get in your car and go, for example, Meg, you were going camping today. If you had absolutely no idea where the end point is, would it make it very easy to get there? Absolutely not. So you have to know what your standard is so that you know how to get there. Mm -hmm. It's a great example. So um, be proactive and not reactive as much as you can. Um, I think that was uh, any time we're doing this, especially for new teachers, that's really hard. I think we build something and then we go, oh, I forgot about little Johnny. And now you're, you're 
little Johnny sitting in your classroom wide-eyed freaking out yeah. or coming to the skill center director and, and, and crying <laughs> because they don't know what to do. And now we've got to go back and say, oh, so we're going to change this and we're going to change that. And, or call the skill center director five minutes before class and say, can you come help, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened before. I don't know what you're talking about. You're such a liar. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've all been there. Yep. Um, you know, yep. it happens. But a lot of these times, a lot of times, I mean, imagine we all have kind of our own little issues, whether it be sensory issues or, you know, we got a little OCD and anxiety right here. And so we know what it feels like to be overwhelmed. And these, these students often live at school in a perpetual state of being overwhelmed. Yeah. So if we can go in prepped and planned and give them and say, this is what I expect you to do, it, it will bring that giant wall down at least half for them. Just by saying, I've got your back. I, I had you in mind. I've got this this right here for you. This is what we're going to do. So listen to the lecture, but these right here, these things are what I want you to do. And that sets them up for success from the very beginning. Um, this right here, this keep, keep a separate grade book um, or keep separate grades, that if we are going to give accommodations and modifications, first off, you have to keep track of them. Please don't expect them to remember what you told them. You need to write it down. You need to put it on a spreadsheet. You need to put sticky notes across your room, write it in Sharpie on your forehead, whatever you need to do, <laughs> remember it. Because then when they get to the test and they're like, oh, there's like five questions on here that I was never expected to know. Mm -hmm. And then once again, that wall goes up and now we have to take the time to break it down again. So keep track of it. Um, one thing that we do at our school is if you have um, a modified uh, curriculum, like so you have an IEP, we actually have in um, FACTS, we have a separate class that has a little asterisk on it, and that is where we put the assignments and the grades. And so on their transcript, it will actually show up in a, as an asterisk. Um, and FACTS and so, is our online grade book. Right. Yeah. And so... That can sometimes be a little controversial. Sometimes people say, well, why? Why are you keeping track of that? Um, and there's, there are goods and bads to that. I, I can't, can't fluff that up and say that it's, it won't cause any harm. Um, that isn't true. Sometimes it's a modification that's so minor that a college will still accept that course um, as a full course. But there are times where the modifications can be so significant in, in, a, in let's say, U.S. history. Um, colleges require you to have U.S. history. Well, if the, you had a modification that was so significant that you're only meeting maybe one of the five or one of the four key standards, that may not qualify to them as you've completed U.S. history. Right. And so they're going to have to maybe take it again through a different online school or community college before... Um, a university is actually going to accept that. So that is a, examples of where it can be helpful and hurtful. And so. again, that goes back to the burden being on the teacher and in the skill center area as we work as a team to make sure that we can accurately report what those modifications are. Right. Well, it's accountability and fidelity. Right. That that's what we really want to do with our grading for every single kid. But it's on us that we're accountable so that we can that we can give a grade with fidelity, whether it's an asterisk grade or not. Right. Speaking of um, OCD, I notice on there it says don't assuming they can do more. <laughs> don't start assuming they can do more. <laughs> Collaborate with your special education team. If you have one or whoever the team is that, that you use, we have a particular um, student that comes to mind where the student is such a hard worker, mm. um, just tries their very best and produces really good work, but unfortunately sometimes to the detriment of the student's own health um, because they'll just work so hard, they'll work themselves in the ground. And not and so tell the teachers. Right, and not tell the teachers. Right. Um, and so it's our job sometimes to protect and guard these students, right. knowing that they take so long 
to do this perfection work, um, we have to be the ones to limit it. Um, this is another good example of when we hand the student, uh, let's say, a syllabus that has, it's the typical syllabus, and then we just highlight and say, this is what you're going to be expected to do. That will drive the student crazy. Yep. Um, so I've, I've asked all teachers, only give the student what you are expecting them to do uh, because the perfectionist in them will will want to do everything, mm -hmm. even if it's not highlighted. So. And all, it also can be demoralizing. I mean, if I, for example, if I were, you know, a gen ed student one year and then all of a sudden I get a concussion and I can't do what I used well, to do and I see the original example. syllabus and think I could have done that and now I can't, that's going to make me angry with myself. Yeah. That one really hurts my heart because we do have students like that now that, um, you know, it, it's such a pivotal time for them right now too is I'm sure you guys had on your episode with um, our counselor, Kelly Weber, this is so difficult. This this time in general in high school is, is a difficult time for them and we do, we have kids that have been straight A students and they get post-concussion syndrome and they don't have any working memory anymore. Um, it takes them a lot longer to read, to comprehend. Lights bother them. Computers bother them. And they're wrestling with um, trying to re-identify who they are as a student. Right, because they can't do as much anymore or as well. And so you're having a, to minister to a lot of socio-emotional needs on top of it. Right. Absolutely. We're going to skip over a slide and talk about that the next time, but um, we can go into a few of the more common disability types that you'll probably see at your schools. Um, autism spectrum disorders being one of them that has uh, become really um, frighteningly prevalent. Uh, there's, and why they call it a spectrum disorder is because it can, it can, vary so widely as to what some of the more uh, common traits, I guess, of, of autism that you'll see. Mm -hmm. um, I, you can read some of them up there, the OCD, the anxiety. We have students um, as well that that affects their learning. Um, but the big one is the transference of skills. And what I mean by that is that when they learn a certain skill, let's say um, graphing, if they learn graphing in math, and then you're asking them to graph in science, we sometimes assume that they should be able to do that. But think about the difference between sometimes you're looking just at mostly numbers and formulas, and now all of a sudden you're having to try to, in science, pull out um, numbers from a lot of words or maybe from um, a lab report. Mm -hmm. And so they may not know how to graph. And it sometimes baffles us going, how do they not know how to graph? They know how to do it in math. But it's that transference of skills that you have to constantly reteach them certain um, skills depending on the environment. One that we're probably going to see uh, come up and already has come up for some of our students now is this online learning. That suddenly home has become school and that's like, mind is blown and it's really hard for everyone but it's especially hard for students with autism. So Carrie to better be able to accommodate and modify for students it's important to understand or at least have a basic understanding of the common disability types. Right absolutely and that you know honestly Google. Google is your friend when it comes to that. I mm -hmm. think that if you can just get a, a background, understanding of what a disability is, and then have a chat with the student if they're comfortable with you, or have a chat with the parents. Um, being a parent of a child with a disability, I can tell you that if a teacher reaches out to help understand my student and my, my son better, that, I, I will walk to the ends of the earth for you. It goes mm -hmm. a long, long way, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It does, because it is exhausting being a parent of a child with special needs, and um, it's, it's exhausting socially, it's exhausting emotionally, um, physically as well. And when you send them off to school, you're constantly wondering, are they understood? Are they cared for? Are they learning? Are they just pencil whipping stuff? Or are they actually trying to reach and teach my student? And so trying to connect with parents um, 
will really go a long way. Oh, that's a lot on your plate, Carrie. A lot to worry about. It's a lot to worry about. As a parent. I, um, I sometimes think I'm a glutton for punishment, but um, a story for another time, how God led me to this. Um, ADHD, the big one is um, we all think of the kid bouncing off the walls, but there's also the ADD where they just have a really hard time focusing and paying attention. Um, we will talk more about executive functioning on the next episode and how that applies to basically all these disabilities. Um, but the planning and organizing is the most difficult part, I think, for kids with ADD, ADHD. Uh, reading delays, whether they're a slow reader with normal comprehension. So it just takes them. That's where that extra time, you know, the, that helps, that accommodation. Or they're a slow and a low reader, meaning they read below grade level and they have low comprehension. Um, that they need oftentimes somebody to read to them or um, they need a simplified version of the book. So like for Uncle Tom's Cabin, all that extra 1860s language is not gonna help them understand that book at all. No. Um, or you have dyslexia. That takes kids a lot longer to get through um, any reading material. Um, so we have to be thinking about that in terms of how can we make some of their learning really succinct or into like a, an audible um, learning or a little sound bite, whatnot. Uh, visual processing. I think I'll get to that one a little bit more when we talk about the, the next episode, especially how it applies to our online learning. But okay. just realize that this is not something like a visual acuity. You can have 20-20 vision and still have a visual processing disorder, meaning your eyes, the signal that goes from your eyes to your brain has a hard time getting interpreted. Um, and so they could be reading something and it's just not being processed, even though they can actually read the words. So. Language delays, expressive and receptive. Receptive is basically receiving input um, auditorily. So what I'm hearing. And then from what they're hearing, they interpret to understanding. Expressive is I can completely understand what you're saying. I'm having a hard time getting out the, um, the language um, skills to actually express what I'm thinking. Those students often do well when you know that by giving them questions in advance for them to think of so that they can actually be part of a group discussion that's flowing and dynamic mm. so that they don't just sit there quiet the whole time. Right. That's often what they'll do. Right. Processing delays, it takes the brain longer to hear, see information, understand it, and then respond to it. The, that once again, giving them cues ahead of time or saying, hey, uh, Johnny, think about this question. I'm going to circle back to you in a minute because then they kind of mull it over and chew, it, chew on it, so to speak, in their brain and they can formulate a thought. But when you ask them to answer like that, they can't and they'll oftentimes shut down. Um, the only real thing I want to talk about with working memory is it, it's basically the ability to, um, there's visual and auditory working memory, but it's the ability to take in information, hold it long enough to manipulate it, understand it, comprehend it, and then formulate an answer based on what you've just taken in. Mm. Um, many, many disabilities actually have a component of working memory. Um, disability and so it just once again it takes them a lot longer to formulate thoughts even though they're they're capable of formulating great thoughts it just takes them a lot longer to do so you know my takeaway from these common disability types are just that there there's so much that I take for granted of my own brain we take for granted what executive functioning does for us um, and kind of a lead into the next episode is that it takes on average um, around 25 to 35 years for our frontal lobes, which is where our executive functioning skills occur, to fully develop. So and it's towards that latter range when you've got any kind of a disability. So when we're talking about organizing and planning, um, self-motivation, being able to take multiple pieces of information, putting it into a nice little pretty package, that is incredibly difficult for students. Um, and it just is exacerbated when you have disabilities. So, And then even more so that. as a teenager, going through all of the different right. emotional ranges. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. a wonder they learn anything. Really. <laughs> it's, so <true. laughs> it's so true. 
So what are our takeaways from this episode? Can I go first? Please. <laughs> we have said this, I would say, in every single episode that we've done for Inspiration Education, and it is know your students. And the message mm. never changes, that you have to know your kids. Yep. You have to be relational with them. You have to get outside of the classroom and know them. But it is even more so here that you have to take the time to know them. I love what you said. Google it. Find out more. You know, do your your own homework and find out more about this kid. Um, don't necessarily wait on someone like you who is overwhelmed. You've got all mm. of these kids that you're having to be an expert on. Why can't we assist you even more by knowing these kids? Right. And the better we know them, the more able we're you know, we are to meet their needs and to do it on the fly, not have to call you five minutes before class and say, <laughs> you know, but know your kids, know your kids, because it, it is truly about them. I, you know, I've, I've come across this phrase in the last few years. There is no such thing as a learning problem. There's only teaching problems. Mm, so true. Right. And so if we if we look at it from that viewpoint, that there's there's no such thing as a learning problem. It, it's on us. It's on. It's a teaching problem, and and you said it, Cassie. We're creative people. We're smart people. We can figure this out. And so, but it all comes to the bottom line. You got to know your kids. What's think, your takeaway, Cassie? Yeah, I think my takeaway, my my big takeaway about this is, or for this episode, is that it isn't about me and it isn't about you, as a teacher. Mm. Me as a teacher, and it's not about you as a teacher. Uh, it's about our students and every single one of them are different yeah. and it's my job to make sure that what I have to say, what I think is important that they know gets through. Am I a hundred percent great at that? No. Will I ever be? Unfortunately, no, <laughs> but I try, you know, you know that just dialoguing about it makes us better. It, t it totally does. It does. And having people like Carrie on our staff and on our team helps us. And so I really hope that, that you also have some sort of support staff that can help you. But if you don't, um, this episode can get you started. And they're, just like Carrie said, Google it. <laughs> and talk to people, right? Find a Elaborate. colleague. Like, you know, we encourage that a lot. Professional learning communities, just or just grabbing a colleague and talk, talk, talk. And that, you know, don't be a silo. Um, the worst thing you could do in this sort of situation, I would say, um, you know, I would pose is to be a silo. And um, if, if you're a silo, that it, you're just making it really, really hard on yourself. So, you know, collaborate with people. Hey, this job is not for the weak of heart. It's not. <laughs> no, it's not. You have to love this to do it every day. I will tell you that I get paid a third of what I used to get paid in my previous profession. Um, and what I did was half as hard. Eh, a third. Uh, and But what I do now is the best job of my entire life. It is so yeah. rewarding. 100%. I have had... I've had the most emotional week visiting with seniors, wait, by visiting, I mean waving to them from a vehicle as we drove past them to tell them how much we love the senior class of 2020. And to see, I could go on and on, and I'm not going to because I know that if you're a teacher that you know exactly what I mean. It's the most rewarding job in the world. All right, well, here we are from COVID-19, from camping to our homes into into your wherever you are all right we'll see you next episode take care bye bye